Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sasha Rush. I'm an AI researcher at Cursor. Today, I'm going to talk on behalf of the Cursor AI research and development team about building Cursor Composer. Composer is a new agent-based LLM that we just released. It combines best-in-class coding intelligence with really efficient speed. The Composer model on our internal benchmark scores nearly as well as the best frontier models and better than models released last summer. It performs significantly better than the best open source models, as well as models that were released with the fast branding. At the same time, the model is four times more efficient at token generation than models of comparable intelligence. The model is also significantly faster than models that were designed to be fast coding models. Why did we build a foundation model? Well, we were inspired by one of the most popular features in the Cursor app, which is Cursor Tab. Cursor Tab is a fast, smart model that users find delightful to use. It seems like having the model be quick enough for interactive use makes it easier for developers to keep a chain of thought and remain in their flow. We wanted to build an agent model that would have a similar experience. And we built a prototype model, which we called Cheetah, that had a fast experience for agentic coding. This model was released as a prototype in the app, and we found that users really liked it. We had a lot of uh, comments that this just felt different or felt like alien technology. And so we thought it would be really interesting to build a model that was much smarter but maintain the same efficiency. Our goal was twofold. We wanted to build a model that was both intelligent and also felt very fast. For intelligence, we weren't kind of targeting arbitrary benchmarks. We wanted to build a model that felt good to use for realistic coding work. We built an internal benchmark from our own repositories that measured the model's ability to work with large code bases and to maintain an adherence to the standards of the code base itself. These factors of intelligence are the things that really matter when you're doing day-to-day -day software engineering. We also wanted the model to feel fast. What that means is both that it generates tokens efficiently, but also that it runs very quickly in your editor. This means we wanted the model both to produce edits quickly, but also to take advantage of things like parallel tool calling in order to produce fast results. When you combine these two things together, you get a model that feels quite different in practice. Here's what it looks like. So here we're submitting a query to the agent, and you see immediately that it's calling many different tools, running terminal commands, running searches over the code base, um, making edits, writing to-do statements, and then finally, just a second or two after your original query, you have the full edit and a summarization of what happened in your code. This is quite a different experience than using typical agents within editors in a day-to-day -day process. So in today's talk, I want to talk about some of the work that the team at Cursor did to build this model. I'm going to begin by giving a quick overview of what we mean when we talk about Agent RL. Then I'll talk about how infrastructure was a key force to ship this model. And finally, I'll talk about what we learned building Composer and where we're going moving forward. So to begin, I want to talk a little bit about how Cursor works. So as we saw in the video, the user first submits a query to the Cursor backend. The agent then reads that query, and then it makes a series of tool calls. We're going to think about the agent mostly as interacting in this tool space. It gets to pick from a series of tools that get to change the user's code. In practice, we have about 10 tools that we use in Cursor. But for now, we can just think of there being read file, edit file, code base search, collecting lints, and running terminal commands. The agent can call these tools in serial or in parallel if it thinks that will re uh, return good results. 
Now, at a low level, this agent is still just a large language model. So all it's doing is generating tokens. You can think about some of these tokens as forming XML patterns, which allow it to call tools, as well as the arguments for these tools themselves. But from an RL perspective, we can mostly think about acting in the combinatorial space of tool calls. When you look at the front end of Cursor, what you're seeing in these rollouts is all of the different tool calls that go into making a change. For things like read, we just summarize them in the front end. For things like edit, you'll see the whole change being made in real time. And for things like terminal call, you'll see both the tool call and the output from the terminal itself. Uh, but this is basically the way the agent takes actions in the world of your IDE. When we do RL, we're going to be running as close a process to how the production cursor works as possible. That means we're going to take our training data and pretend it was just a user query that got sent to the model. That user query will be sent to the agent, and the agent will call a series of tools to try to accomplish the goal. So here in rollout one, we say read a file, and then we edit the file. But what makes RL different is that we're going to be doing many different rollouts from the same starting point. You can think about this as running many mini cursors simultaneously in parallel. So in rollout two, we might use a different series of tools just because the LLM is probabilistic and will take a different path. We then score the output of these two choices, deciding that rollout two was better than rollout one, and update the parameters of our model based on this change. Now, it seems extremely simple, right? It's just, that's it, right? I mean, that's what, that's, that's what we're trying to build. That's how we build uh, Composer. And a lot of the interesting challenges come in just how you take this basic process and scale it as much as you can. And there are challenges at all parts of the scaling process. So let's talk about three kind of core challenges that come up in this style of agent-based RL. So the first challenge is this challenge of matching train and inference. We're going to be training a mixture of experts language model. In order to get the best parallelism, we're going to be doing this distributed across thousands of GPUs. This is hard enough to do if you're doing pre-training or supervised fine-tuning, but it's doubly hard when you're doing RL because you have to have both a training version and a sampling version, and they have to work in sync with each other. The second challenge is that when we're doing actual coding changes with realistic rollouts, the rollouts are way harder than the ones I've shown so far. In modern models, rollouts use 100,000 to a million tokens, and they're making hundreds of different tool calls as they go. On top of that, different rollouts will produce different numbers of tool calls, and they might take very different amounts of time. Finally, there's this challenge of consistency. What we're doing here is basically training through a production product. We have a cursor agent, and we want to mimic that as close as possible in our RL as we can. This means we want to use exactly the same tool format and tool responses as in the production product. But we want to do this at a much larger scale. So all three of these problems reflect challenges in scaling the machine learning part of the system. But the actual solutions to these challenges are all infrastructure um, choices. And so I think for this audience, I want to talk a bit about some of the infrastructure decisions we made that were uh, the kind of enabling factor for us to train this model and release it in practice. So I think the infrastructure we used for training this system probably doesn't look so different than other RL systems. It's still interesting to dive in and see how each of these parts work and the particular choices we made at Cursor to make them work better for our RL setup. So at a high level, we have three different servers. We have a trainer, we have an inference server, and we have an environment server. The trainer mainly uses PyTorch and looks like a standard machine learning stack scaled to a very large degree. The inference server is going to primarily use Ray, and it will orchestrate the rollouts that I discussed before. 
The environment server is going to use micro VMs to spin up stateful versions of these environments to allow us to make file changes, run terminal commands, and run linters. You can think about this as basically running a mini version of Cursor. All three of these parts need to interact with each other. So for the trainer, we're mostly going to take the advantages that come from the inference server in order to update the model so that we can get new parameters. To do this, as I mentioned earlier, we want to train a model that is a very large mixture of expert models, and we'd like to do it as fast as possible. We'd also like to do it in a way that makes it easy to ship to the inference server in order to run our rollouts. One of the main kind of uh, developments that helped us do this was uh, developing a library of custom kernels that allow for low precision training. Low precision training speeds up our training process, and it also allows us to run sampling efficiently without having to do any sort of post-training quantization. We do this by using a microscaling format known as MXFP8. The idea here is that we can work with FP8 precision, but utilize an extra scaling factor that allows us to get better precision and a higher quality training. In our blog post, we wrote about how we were able to develop custom kernels to use this microscaling format and develop them for the latest NVIDIA architectures. So we found that for a mixture of experts layers, this gives us a 3.5 times speed up when using uh, Blackwell chips. And uh, we wrote a blog post that goes through all the fun details of making this work in practice. Once we update the weights, we need to send them to the inference server. The inference server is in charge of running the rollouts, calling the tools, and managing the advantages. The main challenge here is one I alluded to earlier. If you're naive about this process and just let the agent do its own thing, you get an issue with stragglers. This is because the rollouts may call terminal commands, they may install entire libraries, they can kind of do whatever they want. And so what happens is if you run 10 rollouts, they might come back at varying different times. We were able to solve this issue by using Ray and using a single controller interface. This allows us to do load balancing across many different threads and processes and make this part of the process efficient. The inference server is going to spend a lot of time making these tool calls to the environments and getting back the tool results. As I mentioned earlier, our goal was to train through the production Cursor product. One thing that's really interesting about Cursor is that we're able to co-design both the product itself as well as our ML training. Luckily, in the process of building out our RL stack, Cursor released a product known as Cloud Agents. This is a way for you to use the agents offline. I often use it when I'm taking the subway, just check how the models are doing. And as part of this, we kind of spin up a VM of users' environments to allow an agent to change code and run terminal commands. We were able to use this same infrastructure in order to do our reinforcement learning training. So we have this production agent server that's identical when we do these cloud agents to when we train our RL. Now, of course, there are interesting problems. The workload at our peak RL training is going to be much spikier than when running uh, our, our standard product. And so we have to handle the fact that when you spin up tons of environments for training, you have this kind of burstiness that you have to make uh, the product work well for. Um, and this is a kind of dashboard that we uh, kind of coded up with a Composer that uh, tells us how uh, the, kind of the, the utilization of this backend looks. Now, you might say, why is it worth spending all this time to actually use the real production environment? We could kind of uh, mock out uh, all of these different structures or try to simulate how it would work. Um, but one really nice benefit is that we're able to introduce specific tools that we think will be very valuable to the agent. One of these is that we have trained our own embedding model to do powerful semantic search. When you use cursor, we index all of your files and it allows the agent to make natural language queries to find files it might want to edit. We found that this semantic search ability helps all of the different agents that are used in Cursor, 
but it's particularly helpful for Composer. This is because we were able to train Composer with exactly the same model and structure that we're actually going to use in production. And so we're able to train the model to be a power user of this tool. So finally, let me talk a little bit about what we've seen so far in the first week of Composer's release. So the kind of main thing that we saw that made us think RL was really working was the improvement of the model as we ran more and more steps of these kind of rollouts, check, update, loop. The model starts around the same performance as the best open source models in this area. But then as we train, performance on this benchmark increases at a regular rate. The x-axis of this graph is log scale amount of compute. So we're putting in a lot of compute into the RL process itself. But we are seeing uh, uh, gains uh, that correlate with this compute and the performance in the model increasing to the level of the model that we released. Uh, this is really a great sign for the ability to scale RL and particularly the ability to scale L RL to hard specialized tasks. The other thing we found is that we were able to train the model to behave in a way that we thought was useful from a product perspective. So one thing I mentioned earlier is that we want the model both to be fast at generating tokens, but also fast in terms of end-to-end -end user experience. One key component of this is having the model call parallel tools. And as we trained, the model was able to call many more parallel tools and respond quicker to the user queries. We think we can push this even further in future training. We also found that the model learned to behave better as an agent. At the beginning, it was making ma many too many edits and making the edits without too much evidence. As we trained, the model read more files and did more search in order to find the right thing to edit and make the correct change. Probably most importantly, though, is that users seem to like it. Uh, we released it a week ago, and I think the kind of main uh, feedback that we heard is that the kind of Pareto combination of speed and intelligence unlocks a different sort of coding. People are kind of not really like starting an agent and then checking Twitter and then coming back, but actually kind of getting quick results and moving on to their next problem. And so, as a coder, as a developer, um, this is really fun. Internally, a lot of, uh, of our developers now use it in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, experience. Um, so let me end with just some early reflections on building this model. I think at a high level, um, this process has kind of made me feel that RL is really good for building these sort of specialized models. It's a kind of change in paradigm for what we've seen in the last couple of years of large language models. RL facilitates the ability to build targeted models that are extremely smart in a given customized domain. Another thing that's been fascinating is just uh, how the process of doing research and development has changed with AI systems. Much of my day-to-day -day work and many of the people on the team is now facilitated by the use of the same agents we're building. We build dashboards, we build backends, we build all sorts of things with these agents themselves, and it allows us to move quickly with a small team. Finally, I'm not an infra person at heart, but it's been a wake-up call just to see how much of reinforcement learning is driven by infra developments. This is really hard. It requires kind of integrating product with scale, with ML training. It really touches all parts of kind of modern software systems. And so I've really come to appreciate how much infra developments kind of contribute to building these tools. And if this is something you're interested in working on, we're hiring in this space, and we'd uh, love to talk more about building the best coding models in the world. Thanks so much.